Um, Greg uh, is at Stephen F. Austin. He has a wonderful, wonderful dog trot home out in the country. He may have two or three of those things scattered around. I've seen more than one, I think. And uh, wonderfully landscaped. Uh, he, he's an outstanding horticulturist, and we're, we're glad to have him and happy to have him. Thank you, sir. Did you sit down? Not because I got up. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last talk of the day. We're going to talk about perennials. I can't remember if Gail assigned this talk or Bud assigned the talk, but somebody did. Perennials are popular in the, all over the world right now it's, uh, and have been for about 20 years. When I first started working with Extension Service in, in Texas with Bill Welch, who's one of my mentors, the, the perennial movement was just getting started. And it was kind of funny because uh, nobody talked about perennials in the, in the South. Matter of fact, I was at a program where somebody mentioned perennials and one of the experts in the room said, perennials don't grow in the South. <laughs> and, and Bill was the first one to show me that all the perennials that you saw in Northern books and magazines and Martha Stewart and that sort of thing, those particular perennials didn't grow here, but there are hundreds if not thousands of perennials that grow in the South. And, Bill went on to write his perennial garden color book, and I, I learned a lot. And he, but he was the first one to show me, yeah, we got lots of cool things from old things to new things to, to native things that will grow in the South. And so when you travel to Europe, people are always jotting down the name of every plant they see, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. Uh, you can use design from any part of the world, but the plants that they grow in the North and Europe are literally the opposite of what you grow in the South. And so you should write those down to know what not to grow and go through their trash can or compost pile to know what to grow. It's literally that, that opposite. But the printing plant movement started there, worked its way to this country, and, and it's still popular to this day. Uh, it was pretty much an, an English influence, and uh, English have historically been good gardeners. They were the first to take notice of little poor people's uh, cottage gardens and realize how wonderful they were at the time. Uh, the French rigid formal style was, was popular uh, in Europe and across the, uh, the world. When they started noticing, you had these little country people that had these beautiful yards and didn't do anything to them. And so they, they were taken with this naturalistic, free-flowing, uh, multicolored style in these cottage gardens. And then they got to moving into perennials, and they, they literally took the, the English cottage gardens and hybridized them with French formal Italianate style landscaping and invented what we know as the perennial border today. Basically, rectilinear strips of cottage gardens is, is what they were. And of course, they gave us some other design influences, mostly rebellion against French formal design, so naturalistic landscaping, uh, hands-on gardening, and a lot of our early parks and cemeteries in this country were English-style landscaping. Uh, certainly, a lot of today's landscapes need something of any style. <laughs> it's been traditional that most people go out there and plant a foundation planting and then just leave it at that. And so whether it be annuals or perennials or natives, a lot of people could certainly use some spots of color. And of course, a lot of places just could use some spot of living. <laughs> you know, and, uh, I can't say I happen to live in a town that has no landscape ordinance. And I just cringe every time I see a new business or a school or a church. I've seen all those in the last year that paved from the road to the building. And uh, it just seems criminal not to have plants. And uh, certainly uh, natives and perennials could uh, fit into any sustainable landscape. Now the different ways to use perennials, uh, people always get excited about, you know, does it have to be a cottage garden, does it have to be a border, well it can be anything, uh, it's just another uh, puzzle piece to, to use. The traditional ways are in perennial borders, uh, this is my pharmacist friend in Nacogdoches, Bill Job. so literally like the English made famous, these strips of, a, strips of cottage garden, generally in the rectilinear patterns with a maybe an edging in the background of a wall or a rock or a fence or something, so that's traditional. This is Bill Welch's uh, uh, mixed border there in College Station on, on the golf course. Our Zurich border in front of the Tucker House there at the Native Plant Center where I work, so mostly dry loving species. Coral bean in the front there, my mood. And our Firewise landscape in the backyard has a little uh, strip of perennial border where I put my little special uh, sand loving things. Now, before you get too carried away with the uh, <laughs> English style of cottage gardening, uh, it helps if you have some sort of a uh, design to your border. So if you just sprinkle some of everything in there, even nature generally 
doesn't do that. And a lot of us plant geeks are really bad about cramming one of everything under the sun. In fact, Dr. Creech, my boss, is famous for drifts of one, is what he calls it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's like going to the, to the paint store and splattering one drop of every paint in the store on a canvas or a wall. It, uh, it's usually a mess, is what you get. And so uh, the most famous uh, English perennial garden designers of all time, like Gertrude Jekyll, were famous for using uh, masses and sweeps of the same thing. So not one thing, but depending on your size of your border, it could be three, five, seven, fifteen, in other words. <coughs> Big puzzle pieces. Uh, one, because it gives you some more continuity, but also it stands out. A lot of times one plant from the street or from 100 yards away doesn't even exist, so it may take 12 plants to look like a plant. And so one thing I learned in art class and Miss Chavalier's class in junior high is that end of the day, every day you go to the back of the room, the room and look at the project you're working on because it looked very different from the back of the room than it did when you're up close. So up close, you work hard, you pay a lot of money for a plant, you steal it out of somebody's yard while they're not looking. So you, you have so much invested and it seems like it's a lot. And so when you're up close to it, it looks kind of big, but if you get back from it, it may not even exist. I've done entire uh, flower beds before that I thought were wonderful and then you got across the street and you couldn't even see them. So if you can't see it, it's not there, I don't care how much work you put into it. And so uh, grouping some things together, having some masses, having some repetition, which I know people hate to do, but uh, I'm writing a series on landscape design right now for a magazine. And out of my five design principles, I rank repetition the most important of, of all. And it, uh, it helps. People know how to do interior design. They know how to do uh, fashion design. I mean, most people don't laugh at you when you go to work. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to look at you. Uh, <laughs> Floral design, people do a pretty good job of it. But we get in the landscape, we just fling stuff everywhere. And it's like if you're cooking and you go to your cupboard and grab some of every ingredient you have and throw it into an oven and come back 45 minutes later, it's not going to be a pie waiting there for you. So you need a plan uh, when you're planning just like you do with anything else. Perennials can be used as bedding plants. Here's Epcot in, uh, in Florida. Uh, Ladybird Johnson wildflower center with uh, purple cone flower. And so just like you would use it any other bedding plant, except it's going to be a permanent planting as opposed to there are people to change out annuals four times a year in, in beds, which uh, is fine for some people, but for we people that have had surgery in 2003, 2005, 2007, 2010, 2013, 2014, if it gets in the ground now, it's going to stay there. Because uh, if I get down there to try to take it out, I may not get back up. And so uh, perennials by nature come back. And so I used to love changing things out. I mean, I'd plant trees and change them out just because I like doing it. <laughs> but that should have no you failed. <laughs> Here's a Turk's cap in a, in a center Texas garden at the uh, History Center in Dyball, Texas with cardinal flower and little blue stem and uh, golf muley grass. Basically used as bedding plants, but uh, perennial native bedding plants. Of course, uh, another popular way to use perennials that I learned from Dr. Welch years ago is spots of color. In other words, you don't have to do a mixed border. You don't have to do entire flower beds. There are a lot of areas in the landscape there's just sort of a little empty spot there. And uh, somebody the other day was asking me, when you're a horticulturist, you get bombarded with questions every day of your life. And, what can I plant here? What can I plant here? And a hundred questions like, no, don't like that. Wrong color. Ooh, already got that. And so, but, so this week I said, why do we go through this? I mean, I said, just plant whatever you damn well want to and leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> and she, of course, there was a spot there and there's some evergreen behind it. And I named something. She said, well, it needs to be evergreen to go with it. I said, well, no, traditionally we plant opposite things together. So if you have evergreen here, you might want some deciduous in front of it. You have coarse textured here, you put something fine textured next to it. If you've got something uh, tall here, I mean, so, tr so people just feed you all this crap. And it's, you know you're going to do what you want anyway. <laughs> and she said her husband got on her, why'd you ask him if you weren't going to do what he said? And then, she, of course, you know, I got a little, it says that's what women do. And she said, well, of course, then I got like a And then she said, well, men do the same. I said, no, we don't ask, we just do it. We don't care if it's wrong. So just leave, I mean, just do it, dude. If that's what you're going to do, I mean, I like doing stuff and tearing it up. So the, what pastor me? <laughs> anyway, spots of color, great way to use perennials. There's a What's Rebecca that red Maxima. Yucca? What's that red yucca? Uh, red yucca, yeah. which is more of a coral, pink colored 
Uh, actually, one of the desert southwest plants that does pretty darn good in the, in the southeast as well. Full sun, good drainage. Uh, they actually have a, a brighter red one now called a brake lights, I think. Giant coneflower, Rudbeckia, Maxima, the antique rose in uh, This plant is a perfect example of, of what went on with perennials. It's native in the, in the south, a fairly small pocket of the south. Big highways covered with it in East Texas and parts of Louisiana and Missouri, just kind of center of the country there. Well, nobody ever thought of using it here because they saw it on the roadside and just associated it with it's a weed, why would I want it? Well, it got to be popular in Europe, Holland, Germany, Long Island, finally got down to the southeast. Well, guess where the last place it ever even got to be planted was? Where it came from, just because people see, oh my gosh, I don't want that. We'll go buy a piece of crap at Lowe's, it won't even grow because it's different. And you see something that thrives, and you hear all the, I don't like it because it won't die. Well, you won't plant it, it die? It won't die. <laughs> 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 this is a big mama Turk's cap at my parents' place in uh, Shelby County. A little uh, planting of uh, Clematis Texensis there on the mailbox at the Native Plant Center. So uh, you don't have to do entire beds and borders. You can do little spots of color with, with Native perennials. Once again at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center with the uh, soft leaf yucca has spots of color in the a, in a landscape. In our Zeric border again at the Native Plant Center with the white Augusta dual bird salvia and the coral bean again. It can also be used in meadows and in, in prairies. I, I was telling Jeff this morning that I, because I used to like doing flower beds and changing them out every 30 minutes and used to like doing multiple homes and gardens. Well, now you have to think a lot more about what you're going to do and invest your time in. So I'm kind of into doing ecosystems and forests and prairies and things that's uh, maybe a little less in intensive, maybe <laughs> something. I mean, I've made beautiful gardens before and moved away and 30 minutes later it disappears when the guy moves in with a dog sort of thing. So I'm trying to come up with some things that are more lasting and certainly uh, uh, meadows and prairies and forests are things that you can do and, and we have uh, perennials that will work there too. So not everybody has a space to do a, a meadow or a, or a pocket prairie, but I'll show you a pocket prairie that I've been working on for about a decade now. It's in my great grandparents' home just up the road from me, when my great aunt died, the, uh, I took it on as a project and uh, got it restored because it was overrun with cats and old cars and boarded up when I got it in. My parents actually owned it, so once it looked cute, my mom threw me out and said she wanted it back. <laughs> but uh, I spent two years living there and off to the side, I, I took about a quarter of an acre and I bracketed it off with some old bed frames and made me a a pocket prairie. I call it pocket prairie. My dad calls it the weed patch. And every year he says, "Let me all that for you." <laughs> and so what I do, and oh, this is kind of cool. One single Lupinus subcarnosus popped up on the, on the property, and I saved the seed and I got an old wagon wheel ring and laid it out there and poured a bag of play sand from Lowe's down there. And then the next year I had 12, and the next year I had uh, 52, and then 112. And so it's kind of fun watching one of my great grandma's little blue bonnets come up and making a little stand on there. It's just an angle, not a perennial, but a, uh, a burn in the pocket prairie behind there, and so you, you can't do a, a winter burn on a cool season annual, so that's what separates the little sandy land blue bonnet, which was actually our first state wildflower in Texas before they finally threw up their hands and said any lupin in the state could be a wildflower. Now we have five or six. So people don't even know that. And I was inspired by the roadside. Uh, we have a, it's just a typical little country road, but like anybody else's roadside, they don't care. They just worry about mowing it. And some years they go through and spray Roundup. And, but there's all these cool wildflowers that I, uh, they either get mowed before they bloomed or they get uh, uh, sprayed. And so I'm out there rescuing these things and moving them to the little pocket prairie there. And so there's herbertia uh, that there's tons of around there with a little uh, prairie nymph and uh, spiraled bees. The yeah, prairie flocks, flocks, palosa, echinacea, sanguinea, one of my favorites, and the Carolina blue larkspur. And uh, about the second they start to set seed every year is when the mowers come through. So I'm scurrying out there like a bunny, uh, trying to collect seed with the tractors bearing down. And uh, they're pretty darn pretty now without even getting to reseed. I just can't help but think if they'd wait a month later, how spectacular it would be. Is that a pink and blue spread up and down the roadside. There's a Coreopsis and uh, it's uh, Pinstum and Laxiflorus. Grows on some of the dry 
clay slopes along there. Then I collected, I collected all these seeds and I put them in my little pocket for there. The Baptiste Alba came from a stand in Cherokee County when I was the county, I don't hold a job very long anywhere, so I was the county horticulturist in Cherokee County for 365 days and uh, collected that one year. I was only staying like two or three months at places and people were starting to whisper, so I said, at least stay a year so it looks okay on the resume. <laughs> Nobody told me that if your resume was over three pages that that was a red flag too. So <laughs> I won't be getting any other jobs, but I can't. And so here, my, uh, finally getting going with the, with the echinacea, and uh, what I've had the most success with is last, Lazarus aspera, which is just uh, easy to spread from seed and even had a few white ones come up in there. And I picked this bouquet on that very roadside, so that's, that's one of the main guys I've been putting in my pocket for there. I burn it in the spring, and what doesn't burn, I, I mow once a year. Uh, perennial, native perennials can also be cut flowers. Any plant can be a cut flower, particularly if it has a long stem. So some of people think if it's not in an FT bo the bouquet, it can't be a cut flower. Well, uh, some of the prettiest cut flowers are your garden flowers, and that's why. Dr. Welch and Dr. Odenwald did a book called Bountiful Flower Garden. It's about growing cut flowers, flowers from your yard. Those, uh, if you're in downtown Center, Texas, people think a carnation and a mom are the epitome of a cut flower. But if you're in upscale places in the rest of the world, it's anything that looks like it came out of a garden, not something that looks like it came out of a mass production florist. And so there's a Henry Newberg, Salvia, and John Fanny Flocks. Here's one I put together at the Native Plant Center one day. That's a Gallardia. Uh, Winkler's White Firewheel, uh, Peak Turk's Cap, Matt's uh, uh, Peak uh, Beauty Berry, Welch's Peak, give us some purple Beauty Berry, there's a Fall Aster, and so there's lots of cool plants that uh, make great to cut flowers. It's one my mom put together at home one time, that's a, um, let's see what we have here, my Blazing Stars, Columbine, May Apples, and uh, Aeschylus Argita, which uh, my parents live in a place where Aeschylus, Pavia, and Argita overlap, and you get some Cool hybrids that my dad likes to mow with the bush. I was very nervous. <laughs> now, why do we want to use perennials? I already mentioned that by nature they come back year after year, so it's kind of fun to know something. Uh, now, just because it says perennial in the book, I, you know, I do descriptions and throat catalogs and that sort of thing. We're, we're not going to mention that it's going to die the first year, or it's going to smell bad, or it's going to have thorns. We only put the good stuff on there. So I get tired of people quoting the labels to me. Well, it says this and it says that, and I'm like, I know those people. I worked at a nursery with 500 people, and not one of them knew the name of a plant. There's somebody that are writing the labels for the place. I said, just because it says on the label means nothing. And uh, so they're always trying to say, well, it says that there are catalogs now that put every plant in there, zone 0 to 11. <laughs> yeah, right. and, so, and then people quote, and they say, well, it says right here, so I can't go ahead and buy it. <laughs> well, the adapted perennials, and certainly perennials that are native to the south, are going to be adapted and come back. Uh, by nature, they live, and of course, they're specific site-specific perennials that not everybody can grow. But the majority of the ones we use in landscaping are tough things that are going to live. So, you know, if you get an insect infestation on something, then you can just go through there and cut it back. You don't have to get out your chemical arsenal and spray it. And so, there are lots of perennials. First of all, I shear regularly all the time to keep them bushy and, and blooming. But if I've got a bug problem, instead of going out there and spraying, I just cut it back and let it flush flush back out, knowing that it's going to live. Now, you can't do that. You know, if you've got Marigolds or petunias, and you cut them down to an inch tall, they're probably going to die. So by nature, perennials are, are tougher. I don't say they're necessarily lower, lower maintenance, but, but the fact that they're designed to come back year after year makes them an easier choice. So don't have to use as many pesticides. And if you're not using pesticides, because I went to school thinking you'd learn all these magic potions to make everything grow, and that sort of seemed fun for a while, but I mean, there is no magic potion. I mean, you can keep spraying and spraying and spraying and it, that's not really the answer. The real answer is being smart enough to know what plants will plant there and grow in spite of you. And so you don't have to spray stuff to, to make it grow. And then as you're spraying stuff, you don't realize you're killing off lots of other things out there. And there are all sorts of cool beneficial insects that will be out there doing the job for you. So there's a praying man that's snatching somebody out of my uh, peppermint square. I guess just there's Mr. Anoli doing his job, showing his money, as my grandmother would say. <laughs> Garden spider just loved as a kid flinging stuff in there and watching it get wrapped up and sucked dry. And of course, I have a, I love bluebirds and I'm a lifetime member of the Texas Bluebird Society and I've got 120 bluebird boxes. Well, first time ever, I mean, you never pay attention. You just think these bluebirds lay eggs, hatch, and everything's fine. Well, you realize that every 
baby bird of any kind is fed insects and you just put dyes on or dirt in your yard and your yard's full of writhing, dying insects, you see some bird go pick one up and feed it to your precious little babies there, then suddenly you think, maybe I shouldn't be killing everybody in the yard. And uh, so I use hardly any. And, uh, and first of all, if you have something like pyrants that are atrocious, treat the mound, don't treat the entire property. So everybody thinks that you're just going to annihilate every living thing because every bug is bad. Well, a lot more good bugs than there are bad bugs. And just remember that every baby bird eats a bug. And it doesn't need to be one laden with insecticide. And of course, hummingbirds are insect eaters and pollinators as well. And so perennials, uh, some perennials attract butterflies, some attract bees, some attract hummingbirds. My favorite butterfly of all is the zebra swallowtail. We've got a nice stands of, of uh, pawpaws up and down the creeks there. So uh, I get to watch them start in the woods in the spring. And the small guys with kind of greenish white uh, wings and uh, short tails and each generation gets wider and bigger and the tails get longer and they move upland and by the summertime there's a big showy thing up in the in the flower bed. That's of course the sleepiest uh, tuberosa. My second favorite butterfly, of course it's like flowers, you just pick out the pretty ones and learn those and ignore the little ugly ones. But this is a tiger swallowtail or John Fannick flops. I'll try to learn one ugly one every year, thank you. <laughs> Skipper's being at the bottom of the list. <laughs> I'll show you how I use perennials at my uh, old house there. It's a house that belonged to my grandparents. It actually belonged to my grandma's grandparents before that. It was an old dog trot house. By the time I knew it as a kid, it, the dog trot had been closed in, so anything special looked like that when I was a kid. But I thought it was the coolest place on the planet. Of course, I thought they were rich because my Granddad had this giant wallet that wouldn't even fit in his pocket, and he let me count the money out of it. Like a hundred one dollar bills back then. <laughs> I should have known the guy didn't have a job. Where was he getting this? Getting me rich. I got to swim in the number three tub in the backyard and learn four letter words and feed chickens and catch snakes and all that sort of stuff. So I vowed as a child that I was going to live there and look after it. So my grandmother left it to me when she died. And, uh, she told me about it being a dog trot house, so I was determined to open it back up and make it look like it did when her grandparents lived there. I lived in it about 20 years, uh, just looking basically like it did when she was there, and I had all sorts of gardens there. Remember, like changing beds, changing gardens, changing woods. And so I would try all sorts of different things there. I had swept yards and yard art and you name it. It's about every two years, I'd do a new, a new yard, because it's a little yard. That's the beauty of having a small yard. I have acreage around there, and I used to try to garden acres. Well, that's pretty tough, even when you are healthy. And so it's best to set some limits on what you're doing. And at one point, I did an all-American border where I went through the mail-order perennial catalogs and ordered every native perennial that was, was available and planted it just to see what it looked like in the, as a garden plant. So it was literally drifts of one, because there was only one of each thing. I lined them up in rows. I'm a truck farmer at heart, too. And uh, so it wasn't designed. But actually, I was fixing to restore the house in a year, and it was just a temporary planning, but it's kind of fun seeing a, there's a multitude of native <laughs> perennials in, the, in America and the South. So it's not like, um, you know, you say, oh, how can I possibly use native perennials that aren't very many? Well, they're a guy about them. I mean, you can do entire beautiful borders and, and mixed borders and, and diverse borders and multiple cultivars of individual species, so you don't have to worry that there aren't any things to, to choose from. And then uh, Ipamia pandorata on the, on the fence there. Even had a, a temporary pocket prairie there, where I used to have a bulb farm, and then I made a pocket prairie, and then I made a pea patch, and now I'm back to a bulb farm. And I, and the yard itself is actually a perennial border, and of course, I get grief. You know, people that don't garden like to come and tell we, people that do garden what we're doing wrong. They're like, oh, why'd you do that? Why is it that color? Why is there nothing blooming there? Why'd you cut that back? And I, Shut up and go home to your messy yard. <laughs> so one thing Gertrude Jekyll taught me way back there, I used to try to put everything in every perennial board. So I wanted something blooming 24, 7, 12 months a year. Well, that's really hard to pull off. And so when it comes to perennials, you have cool season perennials, you have warm season perennials. So you either grow during the wintertime and go dormant during the summer, or you grow during the summer and go dormant during the wintertime. So mixing those two together is pretty hard. can be done, and I used to try to pull it off. But the problem is, you've got to look after those beds. So uh, when you're in there, most perennials, just about all of them, need cutting back at least once a year. I cut back generally once a month. And so if you're in there cutting something back that's dormant and you're standing on top of something that's in full growth, it's, it's tough. 
And so then I got to read, and Gertrude Jekyll learned way back there that you got more bang for your buck, and it was sure if you specialized in one season. And so you should have a spring border, a summer border. So instead of trying to cram everything in one bed, uh, which is really hard to, to do, and so I make a summer border. And so it's dormant during the wintertime. That's when I can get out there and weed and mulch and cut everything back. And people say, that's ugly. Why'd you let your yard die and all that horrible stuff? And because they don't garden, they don't know, and I don't care. And so it's summer border, and that's what it's designed to be. And I don't have any problem with it. So I, I, and I use sweeps, and I've got things like a box and Turk's cap and, and salvias. And I'll show you some on my up close there. I, uh, it's mainly viewed from the highway, and so I, I try to do big enough masses of the, the plant that I can see them. One, I can see them good from the porch, and I can see them from the road when I'm driving up the driveway. So got some sweeps of John Fanick flocks here, and I've got the peppermint flare hibiscus here. And of course, I'm always developing plants and trialing plants, and I use these for cutting stock for school. So sometimes I slip things in. Like on one side, I've got a Henry Doberg salvia, and on the other side, I've got uh, rebel child salvia. Most people can't tell the difference, but if there's a chance to trial something and upgrade, I, I will. Uh, flocks, perennial garden flocks, which is native to the southeastern U.S., prime example of what you can do to screw up a plant. You're looking at coastal sort of southern hot muggy conditions where this phlox paniculata was originally native. European socks, that's a cool plant. They bring it back to Europe, spend a hundred years making ever giant flowers and multicolored things and oranges and reds and things that didn't happen in the wild. You bring them back to Georgia, South Carolina, where they came from, they won't even grow anymore. And so you can actually take a native plant and turn it into a native plant that won't grow here anymore. And that same thing happened in Texas with Salvia perinacea. That's how I got started working with that. So you can actually uh, quickly have a plant evolve into something that doesn't even like the conditions it came from. Mm -hmm. I went to trial 30 something kinds of Phlox paniculata, and the only five that lived were five that I'd collected out of Southern Gardens. None of the commercial cultivars, which all came from Europe, uh, lived. Uh, John Fanic Phlox actually came out of the San Antonio Garden. And they were typically, the ones that you normally find are magenta pink. And unfortunately, there was a period in garden writing and garden history where that color was banished as being this horrible color that wouldn't go with orange. And for heaven's sake, don't put it in your yard just in case orange ever walked by. So they banned magenta plants like it was a, like going to a first grade and yanking a color out of his crayon box, which just seems criminal to me. Well, because of that, there were no flocks left to grow in southern gardens. And so they developed everything to sell except that. None of them which would grow here. But all the little country people still had the old magenta penguins. And you know why it was magenta? Because that's what color is supposed to be. The same way in the, uh, there are lots of plants like that. The, the color that wants to grow is the original color. That's what it spent millions of years being. And so to say you're bad because you're the color that you're supposed to be is just the stupidest thing ever. And so finally, people started selling the magenta forms of flocks again. Uh, and we were always too embarrassed in the South, like it wasn't in a northern catalog or wasn't on a TV show, and you know, we couldn't do it sort of thing. And so a lot of plants that belonged here that we wouldn't grow, like tea roses and magenta phlox and Byzantine gladiolus, because we thought it was a bad thing, just because they couldn't grow it in the north, and they act like it's bad, and they're, uh, they're not. But no better butterfly plant, and I love butterflies. Uh, I get more butterflies on phlox paniculata in my garden than anything else. And please, I usually rank the verbena family tops with things like vitex and lantana and verbena, but right there side by side, uh, phlox, particularly with the big showy uh, swallowtails, will will outperform them every time. I took this picture with my phone this summer, which was kind of cool on a misty morning, um, looking out across the front front border there. I've got, uh, started a breeding project years ago with Malva viscus or, or Turk's cap, and so on one side I've got a, a Pan Purrier, and the other side a Missy Purrier, which is pretty similar. I'm always comparing different ones. But Essentially, they look uh, the same, trying to get bigger flowers and more compact plants, but no better hummingbird plant than a, than a mouth of viscous, particularly in the fall. And so, literally, they swarm when it comes to migration time on, on Turk's cat. In fact, the first uh, stock planting I ever had of this plant when I was collecting cuttings, there was a hummingbird dead in a garden spider web in the pink Turk's cap, and so uh, sturdy, sturdy webs. This is a Rebel Child Salvia, which was a seedling in my yard, cross between one called Cedar Hill and my Henry Dilbert. I actually went back to the wild to reselect a Salvia Farinacea, because same thing, it grows in the hill country in Texas, no place else on the planet. They took it to Europe, made a bedding plant out of it, you take it back to the hill country, they bloom in the spring, and they wither away during the summertime. 
but he forgot where they came from. But uh, it was actually some material that I found in the cemetery in Central Texas. So people always, betting plant companies think what I do is stupid because uh, they don't have to garden in the South. And, uh, you know, they bred everything to be these short little complex, compact muffins, which is fine if you're in a mild climate. And they always say, well, your stuff gets too big. And it goes, well, if you're not repairing the damage every day in the <coughs> South, uh, you're going to die. And so between drought and flood and hurricane and disaster and cows and pigs and drunk relatives, I mean, you literally have to be growing every day. And I'd rather cut something back than watch a six-inch plant wither away and disappear. So a lot of the plants you buy at the nursery now are bred to be a compact plant in the greenhouse and grow no more. And uh, that generally doesn't cut it here. Uh, it'd be nice if it did, but it doesn't. So most of the people that are saying those things in their garden here. That uh, little salvia in the front there was a uh, salvia azurea seedling uh, that I named Little Boy Blue that was more compact, typically seven foot tall in the, in the wild. Um, and of course, I let old timey reseeding annuals come in there. So if it's an annual I don't have to plant, that's okay. It's a couple of hibiscus that I introduced, peppermint flare on the top, which was a sport of one called flare, with some flex in it. And then a, one that I bred, and I only named plants after people that are dead that I like. And so this bottom one is Jackie Grant, named after my mother, but I didn't name it. A nursery friend of mine did, because it was the biggest, fattest hibiscus you'd ever seen. <laughs> that does sound good for me. And a, once a lady wrote me a three-page letter when I worked at Mercer Arboretum in Houston on why I should name a plant after And she gave all these things to this president of this, president of that, and had done this and done that. And I'm thinking the whole time, she doesn't know my rules. You, know, you have to be dead, but you're not, and have to like you, which I obviously don't. <laughs> so I threw it in the trash and never heard from her again. <laughs> this is a Kostoletsky. Uh, one year I did a breeding, well, for about five years, did a, some breeding work on that, and I named one Cassandra Luce, and this was the sibling to it I selected. This is Peter Luce. And, so and I ain't dead! <laughs> he kind of appeared to be that one time, and so <laughs> I, I pulled the trigger too fast. And the name was already out there. So. Shady. Dead has different definitions. <laughs> This is our native little copper lily, Hebranthus uh, tubospathus texans. I love bulbs and I love uh, amaryllis. Uh, most of the lilies that we grow in the south aren't lilies. Most of them are in the amaryllis family. And so it's a little diminutive little, little rain lily. Blooms after it rains during the summertime. Seeds and naturalized, so it's a cute little thing. Uh, not as showy as all the other rain lilies, but I've always been partial to it. And uh, I planted along with uh, all my other bulbs, oxblood lilies and rain lilies and spider lilies. and the, it's, uh, it's kind of cool because it recedes prolifically and, and it belongs there. So it's a, it's a true, true native there. That's my newest little dog, Lizzie. Cute there, but she's a mess now. <laughs> of course, they don't have to be in flower beds. Uh, Louisiana iris are great, great southern perennials. And this is actually a, a rain garden that I have. So it, it collects the runoff from eight acres of my property. And uh, when I first moved back from Baton Rouge, we used to have lots of ball cypress in, in East Texas. Remember, Sabine River is named for ball cypress, and the Savannah River in the Hill Country, those both came from the Spanish name for ball cypress. Don't have much ball cypress anymore, so I came back with this plan to, to repopulate ball cypress in East Texas. So any places that holds water and dries out in the summer where I can get in there, I go in and plant cypress. So that was my first little little planting when I moved back for, for Baton Rouge. Oh, there's Acer and Ilex in there. This is Acer, he's a good boy, and he's, he's a Starts with a B. She's a literally. She's, she's deaf. She's a moody. She bites. I ran over with the truck. I slammed her head in the truck door. That explains why she's biting me. Uh, she loves you to death, but she's special. She's there. And so, then, literally, all the runoff water from most of my property goes into this little swamp to do what a swamp's supposed to do and clean up the water. And I just happened to, to plant Louisiana iris to look pretty, but also to help clean up the water. So I use all cypress and Louisiana iris. Unfortunately, a number of years back there when I was stupid and didn't know what happened, some iris sodacris got in there. Oh. And so it, it was this beautiful thing. And of course, it's tangled all up. You know how Louisiana iris do. And so I spent the last year killing all of my Louisiana iris, everybody. And uh, of course, I, I sort of like this. Everybody just feels berserk when they see me changing out entire things. And then I'm, I'm going to plant. I love iris full of love. We were talking about this in the bulb world, same thing in the rose world. You start off in love with, like in the rose world, they always say, 
you start off with these gaudy hybrid tea roses, and as you get older, you move to grandiflores, and then floribundas, and then you're fairly ripe in age, you move to antique roses. When you're old man, you got a little five-petaled single thing, you think it's the most delicate thing you've ever seen. <laughs> Same way with Louisiana iris. I'm, I, I love the, uh, the simplicity and the delicate uh, iris fulva. And so I'm going to put nothing but iris fulva in there and along the front. Um, instead of doing my gaudy giant hibiscus, I've just planted a hibiscus daisy calyx, the nature's river rose mallow. So it'll be, uh, it won't be the giant flashy thing. I bred some hibiscus so big when you're it, they'd open up in the morning and all the petals would snap off. And I think, you've probably gone a step too far if they can't last five minutes without all the petals collapsing under their own weight. And so, bigger is not always better. So we're in a transition here, but the fall cypress are happy as can be and reseeding quite prolific. It goes dry during the summertime and it fills up with rain during the wintertime. So how old are those? Those are, Peggy, when did I live in Baton Rouge? Mm, uh, early 1990. There you go. In the in the 90s. 20 years. Yeah. There were one foot tall seedlings from the Forest Service. There's one on the Cambridge Farms around the trunk that makes copious quantities of seeds. So. <coughs> now, funny thing, I put a Montezuma cypress from Mexico in a five gallon pot <coughs> and at the same time. I'd moved back. I was working at Lone Star Growers in San Antonio. And Montezuma cypress, kind of like the cypress in the hill country, it likes better drainage, doesn't make knees. Well, it actually withered and died. It didn't like standing in mud. And of course, the little one foot tall seedlings are as happy as can be. And so they grew in the Montezuma diet, and that's fine. I, uh, of course, I, I like perennials, period. And I, like Richard, I like plants. And I remember Lady Bird Johnson one time whispered to me, she said, I just like flowers. And I'm, well, I'm the same way. Uh, there's this creek back behind my grandparents' house that always, we always call Grandmother's Creek. It's West Creek, and it has uh, some cool plants there. But my favorite was this Trillium recurvatum, which is a Midwestern uh, Trillium, uh, one of the perennial spring ephemerals. It really belongs in Indianapolis and Ohio and Michigan, and it comes down to a tiny little point. I think it comes through the corner of Louisiana and comes to uh, three counties in East Texas, one spot in each of those counties. So just an oddball little thing. But the Bloody Butcher Trillium. Uh, so, calyx lobes bend down and stick to the stalk there where it gets the name recurvatum. Uh, occasionally we'll have tan flowers and occasionally some yellow ones out there that they call variety shady yeah, and they'll have the models folded. So I took it upon myself to, to save these little perennial trilliums there. They bloom right after the bulbs, so uh, bulbs for me uh, finish up about early March. These <coughs> things go to uh, middle of March, first of April sort of thing. I had to fight hard this population that was on my, well, it actually wasn't, I didn't own the properties right next to my property. But one day my uncle stopped and said, there were some people here looking at some plants, said you had a rare flower. We went there and I didn't even know what he was talking about. But a friend of mine who worked at the Native Plant Center before I was there and had worked at the Plant Delights Nursery in North Carolina with another guy. That guy went to work at Kew Gardens in England and was looking at some database that showed this Trillium recurvatum growing in Shelby County, and he asked Matt about it. Matt asked, asked me, he said, do you know about this trillium that grows at FM 138 in West Creek? And I said, that can't be right, because I live at FM 138 in West Creek. <laughs> there was this triangle of land that I didn't own, uh, and they were all right there, and not one single plant on my property next to it. And uh, so my, my grandmother always told me if I had a chance to, to buy the land to, to do it, well, it, this home nearby and 50% interest in the land around it came up for sale and so I bought half interest in this piece of property and for 10 years had this nasty squabbling fist fighting fight uh, mediation three lawyers petition suit uh, <laughs> underhanded the, the people gave away this piece of property to make me have to split it I was gonna have to choose between the picnic grounds by my house at the trillions by the creek, and then my lawyer pulled some fancy move. Bottom lines, after 10 years and a lot of money, I ended up with a, with a trillion patch. Which, <laughs> this was me fighting against a constable and a Baptist preacher, and so <laughs> <laughs> it was a. It was, it was, no, I didn't. They didn't know what they, they didn't know what they were up against. So, I mean, I was like. Seventh generation white trash fist fight and hillbilly there, so they and they lived out of the county, so they uh, because I was smarter than they were too. So it was just pure meanness. It was a standoff, but when it came down to outsmarting them, they got outmaneuvered. So I wasn't fixing to lose the trillium. So if I had to get my uncle Noel to kill them and drag them in the creek, <laughs> that was an option too. And so they they uh. 
beautiful stands of the things they grow down there with May apples and uh, there's uh, a little cut leaf tooth wart and uh, uh, barbed rattlesnake root, and, uh, but mostly lots of trilliums and, and the switch cane. That's two of my past dogs, Rosie and Lily. Bottom line is, perennials are popular all around the world. There's all sorts of cool design you can do. Uh, you can copy design from any place you want. You can do Versailles in your backyard if you want to, but you have to use southern perennials, and no better place to start than perennials native to the south, because they're proven, and it's not like the old days. There are plenty of good ones. They're a compact form. They're different colors, and so uh, we don't have to be apologetic for using perennials that don't grow in the north. We don't care if they're cold already in, in Michigan or whether they can grow them in Stuttgart, so it uh, doesn't matter what's in the magazine. Copy design if you want, but southern perennials are, are perfect for Thanksgiving years. Okay, uh, before I forget, you're all welcome to visit us there at SFA Gardens. We're nothing fancy. We've got the uh, Arboretum, the Native Plant Center, the Gala Mize Garden, the Ruby Mize uh, Azalea Garden. We're free. We're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're offer full refunds on the way out if you don't like it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Greg, mention the Azalea Convention, oh. if you would. We have the uh, National uh, Azalea Society or Rhododendron Society? Azalea. Azalea Society is having their National Convention in Nacogdoches this year, and it's uh, hmm, late March. If you go to the, the website there, uh, it'll give you the dates and the times. There's tours, and the, it's uh, we have a beautiful, beautiful... Now, typical about the creek, when you see a azalea garden, you picture just a bunch of azaleas. Well, not what I preach, I and mean, that includes several hundred different kinds of Japanese maples, several hundred different kinds of camellias, hundreds of different kinds of hydrangeas, one of every oddball plant he's drug home, and so it's not a one dimensional garden. Plus, uh, 500 different kinds of azaleas by the I mean, it's, it's a spectacle. And I remember when they started that garden, I said, Dr. Peach, there's going to be a day when this is the only garden that's going to 